All right, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. So we're gonna start a new unit today, principal component analysis. And um, <clears throat> our main goal today is to uh, reduce the dimension, in particular the feature dimension. So, um, <clears throat> And as you know, we usually think of the feature dimension using the variable D. And um, some of our toy data sets have a small dimension D, but many realistic data sets have very large dimension D. And there's a number of reasons why we would want to uh, shrink that dimension. So first of all, we saw that the complexity of our regression and classification tasks increases with the dimension. So maybe we could make those tasks simpler. We could perhaps just save memory and storage space when storing our data. And if we can get D down to, um, for example, two or three, we could visualize structure in our, in our features. Because otherwise, it's very hard to visualize this overall structure of the data set. So um, there's many ways to do this. But in this unit, we're going to focus on um, one of the most famous methods, which is known as uh, Principal Components Analysis, PCA. And as we'll see, this is the RSS Optimal Linear Dimensionality Reduction Technique. And towards the end of the unit, we're going to describe a few other techniques, T-SNE, UMAP, uh, maybe another one. And these are <clears throat> nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques that are um, specifically used for visualization. So they're used to get <clears throat> down to two or three dimensions so you can visualize a data set to see if it's possible to classify it or not, for example, or just see the structure in it. <clears throat> okay, so in this unit, our data set is only gonna be the feature vectors xi. As always, i goes from one to n, n being the size of our data set, and <clears throat> As always, the feature vector is xi. Um, there's a total of d entries in every xi. d is the feature dimension. And as we've been doing for a long time, we can stack those uh, as row vectors horizontally into a big matrix. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that's easier to work with. And we're also going to remove, uh, assume that the mean has been removed already in our data set. So the mean is gone. So basically, sum of the xi's equals 0 for every entry. So every feature index has 0 mean. <clears throat> and so one big thing to notice now is that in this data set, there are no, um, there are no targets or labels in our data set, right? There's no y's. There's just xi's. And this is. Um, an example of what we call unsupervised learning, which is not something that we've considered yet in the course, but now, from now on to the end of the term, we'll focus on unsupervised learning. So all we have is the data set xi of feature vectors. So this unsupervised learning is contrasts from supervised learning, which is what we have been considering previously, regression, classification, and so on, where you have the x's and the y's. <coughs> Okay, so again, our motivation in this unit is how to deal with the situation where the data dimension is very large. Is it possible to reduce the dimension to make everything else easier? So the data set we're going to work with in this unit is, um, <coughs> is a, a data set of faces, face images. As far as images go, these are not very large. They're only 50 by 37. But if you count the number of pixels in each image, it's 1,850 pixels. So basically, you know, if you just represent the image as it is, as it's given to you, that would be 1,850 real numbers. And the question is, can we, can we reproduce these images or can we represent these images using many fewer numbers than 1,850? And we'll, we'll see that the answer is yes, and we'll see um, <clears throat> Yeah, we'll see how this works. 
So we want to approximate them using just a few coefficients per image. And essentially, you can think about this as doing compression. We're essentially doing a form of compression. Other forms of compression that I'm sure you've heard about are like JPEG for images, MPEG for movies, and so on. This is, you could say, a simple classical form of compression, and then it's a linear, where a lot of those other methods would be nonlinear. OK. So just a little bit more about the data set. Um, this is one of these data sets that's built in to sklearn. And the full data set contains 13,000 face images. These faces are from new stories in the 2000s. But we're going to require, when we load the data, we're going to require that we have at least 70 faces per person. And as you'll see, when we, when we do that, here is like, here's, here's the code. We're going to um, import this loading function. In the loading function, we can say min faces per person is 70. And we're going to, um, we're going to scale them a little bit as well. But basically, we're going to get 1,288 total samples. And it turns out that there's um, seven different. So th this ends up being a labeled data set. So each one of these faces does have a label, which is the person whose face is showing. However, we are going to um, ignore those labels until the very end. And then we'll, we'll show, finally, how we can use PCA and then do classification with PCA-reduced features. And so when we do that classification at the very end, that's a supervised task. We're going to use the labels. But for the dimensionality reduction, we don't need to use labels. We'll ignore them, and we'll just deal with the faces themselves. <clears throat> okay, so basically, we're going to have seven different people. Each person has 1,288 faces. The faces are of size 50 by 37 or 1,850 pixels. Okay. All right, so that's the data. But we're going to take a detour and talk about the methods for a while. <clears throat> so let's first describe what is PCA. So the, you can say there's two main ideas behind PCA. It's a linear approximation technique, number one, and it's the linear approximation technique that minimizes RSS, number two. OK, so let's unpack both of these. So linear approximation, what does that mean? Well, it means that each one of our uh, elements from our data set, xi, we're going to approximate this by designing a matrix B. And that matrix B we're going to use for every sample in our data set, for every i. But then every xi is going to be approximated by a linear combination of the columns of B. And the combination coefficients are going to be called zi. And those coefficients will vary with i. OK, so we're coming up with sort of a universal dictionary, you could say, that um, that has R elements or R columns. And then we're going to have some, for, for every I, we can adjust the uh, relative weight of those different columns. And we'll encapsulate those into these ZI vectors. And again, let me emphasize, so R, this little R, is the uh, dimension that we're reducing to. So in other words, we start over here with dimension D, but then over here, we have dimension R. So after we do this, in order to represent our data set, we will have one matrix, B, and then we will have N of these vectors, ZI, and the ZIs will have R elements, whereas the original data set, XIs, have had D elements. So we would like R to be much less than D. That's how we're doing the compression. Okay. R needs to be some number, in general, um, between 1 and D, actually not including D. Because if, if R equals D, we don't really need to do anything. We're not doing any compression at all. Um, in, the, in the smallest case, we could be estimating everything with one column and just a scaling of that column. Now, that's probably not going to work so well, but um, 
it is something you could try to do. And we say that this is a linear approximation just because xi is being approximated as a linear combination of b columns. Being linear, that's easy to work with, but it's also the simplest possible thing, and so it's not necessarily going to uh, work the best. But it's a very famous method, so it's worth learning about, and we'll learn many other things along the way. Okay, so that's kind of structurally what PCA does. It uh, works on this approximation here. But now, how do we design B and ZI? Those are the things we need to design. We're going to design them to minimize RSS. So here we have our RSS cost, XI minus B times ZI. We can uh, sum that over all our data set, uh, data vectors I. And we're going to minimize this both over B and all our ZI coefficients. And this thing is what we call principal component analysis. So again, RSS is something we've worked with a lot before, as we know, because it's sum of squares. It's very easy to work with. Um, it's probably the easiest cost we could formulate. So that's why we're using it. It's used for simplicity. You could, of course, imagine many other more sophisticated things in place of um, sum squared error. And in fact, we have to be a little bit careful when we use something like RSS. Um, this may not be optimal for some downstream task. So let's say that what we are doing is we have a data set with these feature vectors xi. We are shrinking them down to make a new data set with zi's. And then let's say we want to use those zi's for classification. Well, the problem is that maybe the information most needed to classify the different zi's is not well represented by the sum of squares, and so maybe we would throw it out. We would think that information is not really affecting us very much in terms of energy, so let's get rid of it in our approximation, and then our classification would fail. Okay, so classification is not really well matched to RSS. So we have to just, um, just remember that PCA is just one thing you can do. It is not optimal for anything more than minimizing RSS. It's not optimal for things like classification. So it may, in fact, it should hurt your performance. If you do PCA and then you classify, you see your performance go down. It might go down a lot, it might go down a little bit. Um, it really depends on your data set. Still, it's a popular method. It's, it's something that uh, people often try to do just to simplify things. Okay, so next I'm going to tell you what the solution to the problem is, and then we're going to derive this solution. So here's the solution. Um, <clears throat> you start out by computing the sample covariance matrix Q. Now you might say, why is this a covariance matrix if we're not subtracting the mean from Xi? But remember that we already assumed that Xi had its mean subtracted. So this looks like a correlation matrix, but actually it's also a covariance matrix because xi is zero. Okay. So let's say you compute this covariance matrix, call it Q, and then let's say you take an eigen decomposition. We'll talk more about eigen decompositions um, very soon. What that means is that you can rewrite um, you can write Q in this way. These Vj's, these are called the eigenvectors. These lambda j's are called the eigenvalues. And it turns out that the optimal B for PCA, what you do is you look at these eigenvalues and you figure out which are the R biggest eigenvalues. And then you look at the corresponding V's, we call those the principal eigenvectors. You stack those Vs into a matrix, we'll call it VR, should be a tall matrix, and that VR is the optimal dictionary. Okay, so again, just to say it more quickly, um, the optimal dictionary 
is a matrix constructed by the R eigenvectors, which correspond to the R largest eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix. Okay, so that's how we get B. And then <clears throat> to get the ZIs, or Z hat eyes, we'll call them, these are the um, optimal coefficients. You take your original data set, or original data vector Xi, you multiply it by that same matrix, VR transpose, and that will reduce its dimension down to something of size R, and those are your optimal um, coefficients. So these are the, the two things. This is actually itself what PCA does. Compute this eigen, the sample covariance matrix, do the eigen approximation or eigen decomposition, and then, and then essentially truncate it to R elements, and that gives you both your dictionary and your coefficient vectors. Okay, so we'll derive that, but now let's take a look at um, some pictures that will help to make this a lot more intuitive, I think. So what, what we do is we look, these are two different examples where the original data set is three-dimensional, so the original data set lives in this three-dimensional space. But in the first case, we do a PCA approximation of dimension two. So we reduce it down to two. And then in this other case, reduce it down to dimension one. OK. So essentially, you can think of PCA with dimension two as finding the plane which best fits the data set. And by best fits, we mean that the distance between the points in the data set and the plane is minimum in some squared error. So these Euclidean distances, the sum of the squared Euclidean distances are smallest. So imagine that you can control this plane. This plane is essentially, if you look at the column vectors of B and you think of those as you know, some vectors in this space, and you, think, you imagine all the linear combinations of those co two column vectors, you end up getting an entire plane, right? All linear combinations of these two vectors. And that plane, that's the thing we can control is where that's located. We just kind of move it around until the sum of these squares is minimized. Um, is that making sense, what we're trying to do? So it's basically like, yeah. From an energy perspective, we're finding the best way to reduce our data set to a smaller dimension. RSS is like measuring energy. Now, if we do this in one dimension, that means instead of looking for a plane, we're looking for a one-dimensional subspace, which is a line. So how do I move a line around until the sum squared of distances from my original data set to my line is minimized? And you know, if you did that, you would find that this is the best line. Any, any tilts or shifts of that line would only increase those distances, and it would be a worse approximation. OK. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so, these, so when, you, when you analyze your data set, and you build this covariance matrix Q, and then you, you analyze it by doing this eigen decomposition, basically, the Eigenvectors, the R eigenvectors corresponding to the largest R eigenvalues are known as the R principal components, and that's why this is called principal component analysis. Any questions so far? Okay, is this idea making sense? Uh, I want to make sure it makes sense before we launch into all the math, because the math surely won't make sense if the idea doesn't make sense. Okay, everybody good? All right. All right, so the derivation proceeds in two steps. The first step is, because we have two things to optimize, remember. We have to optimize the ZIs and we have to optimize the B. So we're going to do this in two steps. First, we're going to optimize the ZIs by keeping B arbitrary. And then we'll take the expression for the optimal ZIs, plug that back in, and then the, it will only depend on B 
and then we'll optimize the dictionary B. Okay, so the first step ends up being super easy. So this is how you could state the optimization problem for the ZIs. Um, so basically, okay, in terms of RSS, let's remember we have a sum over I of Xi minus B times ZI. And so here we're summing over all our data. But I want to I want to design all of these ZIs. So if I just focus on, let's say, the first I, I equals 1, then I don't really have to worry about the sum. I can just worry about this for I equals 1. Or if I want to optimize the second I, I don't have to worry about the sum. I would just look at I equals 2. And so if I just focus on a single I, I can forget about the sum and just focus on that single I, and that's where we're getting this problem. So here I'm designing ZI. All I have to do is minimize this, uh, this cost here. And this is something we did back in Unit 2. Um, you can expand this. You can take the partial derivative with respect to the different elements of ZI, set that partial derivative to 0, solve for the, the ZI that sets it equal to 0, and you find you get exactly this least squares solution here. Okay, so Z hat I, the optimal ZI, is given by this. So that's the easy part. It's, the hard part is optimizing the matrix B. Anyway, once we have the ZIs, we plug them back into here, plug this expression back into there, and then we get this expression here. And here we're optimizing now over B. And once we figure that out, we will know how to do PCA. Okay, so, um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this in a slightly simpler way. So we have this matrix here, and we have Xi here and here. You can actually rewrite this by saying Xi times this matrix I minus all of this. Right? And this matrix here, we're going to give this a name. It's going to be, we're going to call this PB perp. So this is the perpendicular sign. And as we'll see, this perpendicular sign has a certain meaning. We call it P because this is a form of what's called an orthogonal projection operator. Um, this part also is a projection operator. And when you have the 1 or the I minus, that's another kind of projection operator. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, we have to understand more about these types of matrices in order to understand how to do this approximation. OK, so um, how many of you guys have learned about orthogonal projection sometime in the past? OK, so I wouldn't be surprised if you guys have seen this somewhere or several places, but in any case, it's good to review it. Or it's an important idea if you haven't ever seen it before. So the idea, let me just start with some words and pictures. Imagine that you have a plane. And you have a vector, which is, in general, not going to be in that plane. So this would be the origin here. <clears throat> and your goal is to find the closest point in the plane to your vector x. So you, you essentially want to find this point. The closest point in the plane is going to be the one where there's, um, you'd say, the Okay, you can think of this as the error vector because essentially what you're saying here is that you can write x as x hat, which is the approximation, plus an error, e, right? x is x hat plus e. And if you want to find the closest point in the plane, you're not going to go off at some, you know, angle here because the distance if this is in the plane to here is larger than the distance from here to here, the closest point of the plane is going to be the one where the error is orthogonal 
to the plane, right? Like if I want to find the closest point to the wall here, I'm not going to go from here to there. I'm going to find where, where can I go perpendicularly to the, to the wall. Okay, so, so that's the idea. And um, now mathematically, when we talk about this plane, we are going to refer to this um, as a subspace. So a subspace in linear algebra is a set of vectors and all of their linear combinations and scalings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the vectors that are the columns of B. And I'm going to, because remember, if I do B times Z, that's like saying a sum of each column times the corresponding coefficient in Z. And I'm going to imagine all the possible linear combinations of, of those columns of B, essentially by looking at all the possible real numbers inside the Z vector. So maybe I start out with, um, I'll draw it here. So maybe I start out with, let's say, the first column of B and the second column of B, and these are both vectors that are in the plane. And now when I consider all the linear combinations of those two vectors, then I get all possible vectors in this plane. Yeah. So we, this is a subspace, and, and we give it the name the column space of B. It makes sense, right? Because we're looking at linear combinations of, of the columns of B. So the column space of B. And uh, this is something that is living inside a larger space of dimension D. So this is a subset of the D-dimensional space. So the D-dimensional space is like this whole world, which, okay, in this picture, that would be a three-dimensional space, whereas in this picture, the plane would be a two-dimensional space because it's spanned by the two columns of B and all their linear combinations. Okay, so is that those ideas making sense? So we, we have this column space, and we have a vector x, which may or may not be already in that column space. It's more interesting if it's not. And so we want to say, what is the orthogonal projection of x onto the column space? Essentially, we want to project this down, find the closest point in that space closest vector to x within the column space. <clears throat> so visually, it's sort of like if you imagine that there's a sun shining above, down, and you're looking at, and it's, it's pointing directly, the sun is shining directly orthogonally down on this plane. You're looking for the shadow cast by that point. That will be right where the best projection is. So essentially what we're doing is we're building we're building or decomposing x into one component x that is in the column space plus another that is perpendicular or orthogonal to the column space. So this orthogonality this is described by this right angle here. So that's very important. So is everybody with me so far? OK, so in order to do this, um, <clears throat> mathematically, we can come up with two matrices. The first matrix, PB, well, this is the projection matrix that takes us from x to x hat. And the second is an orthogonal projection matrix that takes us from x to E. So these are these two matrices. The one that takes us from x to x hat looks like this. We'll call it PB. So this is B transpose times B transpose B inverse times B. So the shapes of this in general look like a tall matrix. And then um, this is going to be, this is going to be a small square matrix and then another wide matrix. And then 
PB perp is just I minus PB. So altogether, if you add PB perp and P, that gives you identity. So we're splitting the identity into these two parts. So these are called projection operators, orthogonal projection operators to be specific. And the only two requirements we have for orthogonal projection operators is that they are symmetric, which means that you know, the matrix equals its transpose, and idempotent, which means that the matrix, if you think about the matrix as like an operation, and you apply that operation twice, it's no different than applying the operation once. Another way to say that is if you have a vector x and you project it into the plane to get a new vector x hat, and then you project x hat into the plane, well, nothing changes in the second step because x hat is already in the plane. The same would be true for PB perp. If I take x and I compute the, orth the approximation error e, and then I, again, uh, compute the approximation error of the vector e, that's just e because it is completely orthogonal to the plane. Okay, so pb squared or pb perp squared are just pb and pb perp respectively. Okay, and one other um, interesting thing, we'll talk about the eigen decomposition in a second, but when you look at the eigenvalues of pb, this matrix, you find that R of them equal 1 exactly, and all the other eigenvalues equal 0. For PB perp, if you look at them, R of the eigenvalues equals 0, and all the other ones equal 1. Okay, so these are just a few kind of random facts uh, that are very useful when you're working with these projection matrices. Okay, so overall, we have this concept of taking a vector, projecting it into um, it could be a plane or it could be a subspace really of any dimension. If I do this with r equals 1, then I'm talking about projecting onto a line. But, you know, you could do higher dimensions as well. It's just hard for us humans to visualize them. Okay. So why are we talking about projection? Well, let's think back to our PCA problem. This is how we finally wrote it. It's basically the sum the norm squares of PB per x. So xi this. So now we have an understanding of what this is. PB perp times xi is the approximation error for projecting xi into a plane or a subspace that is defined by the columns of B. So in other words, I can change the columns of B. I want to change them to minimize the Euclidean, the squared Euclidean norms of the projection errors. So that's where we get this picture. These are the projection errors into the plane. And I want to look at their sum squared distances, and I want to tilt this plane around, shift it until those are minimized. Okay, PCA chooses B to minimize the sum squared projection error. Okay, does that make sense, sort of what we're doing with the linear algebra? Okay, so now we're just going to play a few games with linear algebra to rewrite this in terms of the sample covariance matrix. So these are, I think, things we've all seen before. Um, doesn't hurt to see them again. So we start out with the cost from above. The very first thing we're going to use is the idea that if you have the sum they're the squared norm of a vector. You can also write this as the vector A transpose times itself. So we can do that with this being A. And so here we have A, and then here we have A transpose. Of course, if I transpose product of two things, I have to transpose them individually, but also s swap the order. So that's where I get Xi transpose, PB perp transpose. Okay, but now... Remember that these projection operators are symmetric and idempotent. So if this is symmetric, it means that the transpose is doing nothing. I can ignore it and just think about this as PB perp squared. 
But if it's idempotent, then the square is doing nothing. And I can just think about this as PB perp itself. Okay. Next step <clears throat> is to say, all right, to form a covariance matrix, I want to rewrite this in this form where the XIs are together. But right now, the XIs are split. One is on the left side of PB perp, the other's on the right. So how do I get them together? Well, this is where we can bring in the trace. And the trace has this really nice property that the trace of two things, let's say a product of two things, A times C, is the trace of C times A. So you can always swap the order inside the trace. The trace is the sum of the diagonal elements of its matrix argument. So what I can do is notice that this is a scalar. So this, a scalar is like a very simple matrix with only one diagonal element. So essentially, if A is a scalar, then the trace is just A itself. So what that means is I can just put a trace around this thing without changing anything. Because I'm thinking about this as a one by one matrix, and that is the sum of the diagonal elements of that one by one matrix. So that's the trace. But now that I have the trace there, now I can move Xi to the front, or I could move this Xi transpose to the rear. So either one works. Let's use the second one. Move Xi transpose to the rear, and now we have this. <clears throat> and finally, uh, we have the fact that the trace is a linear operation. So that means this summation can be moved inside the trace. And in fact, since the summation's over i, I can move it through this matrix multiply to get over here. We're almost done. If I want to write this as a sample covariance matrix, all I need is to have this 1 over n scaling. So now it turns this into an average. And then just to compensate for that, I'm going to put this n on the outside. And so here is our sample covariance matrix Q. And finally, this cost that we're trying to minimize can just be written as n times a trace pb perp times q. So this is, remember, like when we talked about the solution to PCA, it was, it was all about the sample covariance matrix Q and its eigenvectors. Well, finally, we have things written in the form of Q. All right. Any questions on this part? All right, so let's move on. And let's talk a little bit more about eigen decompositions. And specifically, eigen decompositions of these sample covariance matrices. So one important point is that this sample covariance matrix, Q, is what we call positive semi-definite. A positive semi-definite matrix is a matrix such that for any <clears throat> vector, <clears throat> excuse me, for any vector x, if you create a quadratic form with this by doing x transpose qx, this is guaranteed to be non-negative. That's what it means for this to be positive semi-definite. There's related concepts of get rid of the positive and the semi and you have positive definite. That would mean that this is a strict grader. You also can find negative semi-definite or negative definite and so on, but we're interested now in positive definite because that's the property we get when Q is a sample covariance matrix. So let's just do a real quick proof to convince ourselves that that's the case. So if I have this thing X transpose QX, and I know Q was created like this as a sample covariance matrix, <clears throat> then by linearity, I can move the 1 over n and the sum to the front. And then I can regroup. I'm going to have x transpose xi and xi transpose x, like this. And the parentheses are there just for, to help our understanding. <clears throat> and in particular, realize that this x transpose xi is scalar, as is this. These are, in fact, the same things because if I transpose a scalar, it's, it just, I just get the same thing. And if I transpose this, you can see I get this. So really, these two things are the same, and it's just one thing squared. <clears throat>
And now you see, essentially, I have the average of a bunch of squared quantities. Well, because these are real numbers, when I square real numbers, I can get zero or something larger. I can never get something negative. And so if I have the average of non-negative things, then that's also non-negative. <clears throat> so we have a little proof of this positive semi-definiteness when we construct Q like a sample covariance matrix. And that's going to be very useful. <clears throat> okay, so let's go one f step further <clears throat> and say all of these positive semi-definite matrices have an eigen decomposition of this form. Okay, so let me tell you why that's significant. So for most matrices, square matrices, you can write the eigen decomposition like this, where you have V lambda V inverse. But what's special here, there's a couple of things that are special. And, oh, and in general, the, these lambdas could be complex value. So what's special here is that, number one, instead of V inverse, we have V transpose. And this actually results from the fact that the V matrix you get with a positive sum and definite Q is an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrix is one where all the columns are orthogonal to each other and they have a unit norm, and all the rows are orthogonal to each other and have a unit norm. <clears throat> so if you think about what that means, it means that V times V transpose is the identity matrix. Or similarly, V transpose times V is the identity matrix. And when you look at it this way, you can see that the inverse of V is just V transpose, right? So to invert a matrix is usually very difficult. It's an expensive algorithm. But to invert an orthogonal matrix, all you have to do is transpose it. So as a result, this V inverse turned into V transpose. The second thing that's significant is that, okay, this, this, is, a, this is always a diagonal matrix, even in the regular uh, eigen decomposition. But now, the important thing is that these eigenvalues are real numbers that are non-negative. That's not usually the case. Okay, so V is orthogonal and lambdas are non-negative. So that's, that's what's special if you have a positive semi-definite matrix. You have this form of the eigen decomposition. And that's going to be super important as we solve this PCA problem. Okay, we're going to assume, to make our life a little easier, that the eigenvalues are sorted from large to small. And even if, you, even if they're originally not sorted, all you have to do is, is rearrange the order of the eigenvalues and then rearrange the order of the eigenvectors, just reorder them, and you can always do this. So, so we'll say that this is without loss of generality. It's, it's not really a significant assumption at all. Okay, so this is um, super important. Um, I'll just write here. This usually is the case. And um, so now the last step, which we'll, we'll prove, but first we'll state it kind of as an important theorem from linear algebra, is that if you want to so again, what we, what we did in this previous step is we rewrote the cost we're minimizing this way. N trace PB perf Q. So here's our cost. If you want to find the B that minimizes this cost, essentially you take this Q, do its eigen decomposition, sort the eigenvalues from largest to smallest, and then take the corresponding, so this is, this is if R is the size, the number of columns in B, then you take the R biggest eigenvalues, sorry, eigenvectors, you stack those eigenvectors in a matrix, give it the name, capital VR, and that is the optimal B hat. 
<clears throat> There's a little bit of flexibility actually in this. Um, once you find this set of Vs, this, this determines the column space. You can take any, you can, for example, do something like reorder this. You can scale any of these elements. Um, you could even take some subset of them and do some linear combination. There's things you can do to write B hat in a different way, but the important part is that the column space of B must be the column space of these vectors. So we're just going to focus on showing that the vectors themselves give you b hat and just noting here that there is a little bit more flexibility. Okay. So just a couple more pages then to do this last part of the proof. Again, this is our cost. This is what we want to minimize through choice of b. Let's rearrange this a little bit. So let's write this pb perp. This is the orthogonal projection or the projection matrix onto the uh, orthogonal complement of B. We can write this as I minus PB. And then let's expand this. So we have, again, because the trace is linear, this is N times trace of I times Q, which is this, minus N times trace of PBQ, which is this. And if my goal is to optimize B, then I don't have to worry about this first term. That's not a function of B. So if I want to minimize JB, I can maximize this trace PBQ. So we'll think about this not as a cost, but as a utility. I want to maximize this utility, we'll give it the name U of B, which is trace PBQ. Okay, so let's now plug in our eigenvalue decomposition, uh, V lambda V transpose. Let's use this trace trick where I can move, I can reorder, so I'm gonna move the V transpose to the front. And then let's take a close look at what we have. So we have a matrix here, and then we have another matrix that's multiplying it, but this second matrix is diagonal. And at the end of the day, I want the trace, which is the sum of the diagonal elements of this whole thing here. But let's just think about what is the very first diagonal element of this? It's, it's because this is diagonal, it's gonna be the first diagonal element in this matrix times the first diagonal element in this one. All right, so if I have like a matrix and then I have another diagonal matrix here. And I want to know what's, what's the first diagonal element of this. It's going to be this guy times this one. I don't have to worry about any other terms in this matrix if all I care about is that first diagonal element. Similarly, if you ask me what's the second diagonal element in this product matrix, it would be the second one here times the second one here. I don't have to worry about any of the other ones. And so finally, when you look at the trace, which is the sum of all the diagonal elements of this, it's just going to be the sum of the jth diagonal elements of this. And as we said before, to get the sum, I can just look at the, the jth diagonal element of this, which I'm going to call alpha j. Here's the definition. This, you can see, this is the jth row, jth column, so the jth diagonal element of this, times lambda j which is the jth diagonal element of this. <clears throat> okay, so essentially we only need to worry about the diagonal elements of this. We don't have to worry about any of the off diagonal terms. <clears throat> so the utility we want to maximize, we can just simply write this way. It's the sum of alpha j times lambda j. Yes? How did you the lambdas? The lambdas? Uh, it's not diagonal, so that matrix is a full matrix, right? But the point is that if I want to compute the diagonal of the product of these, then I only have to worry about the diagonals of the two individual ones because the second one is diagonal. <clears throat> By the way, this is not true. If, if you have just two 
dense matrices and you want to find the, let's say the first diagonal element, what you, what you need to do in general is you would need to take this entire column, sorry, that entire row times this entire column to find the first diagonal element, right? But once you set all those except for the first to zero, which is what's happening here, that means that you're multiplying all of these by zeros and the only one that matters is the first one and the first one here. So that's what's happening when we compute this. <clears throat> okay, so we can see that we want to maximize the utility that has this form. The alpha j's are defined this way. Let's take a slightly closer look at these alpha j's. So um, we want to look at the jth row and jth column or the jth diagonal element of this V transpose PBV. So if you think about this, this is a product of three dense matrices, but I'm, let's say I'm interested in only the first diagonal element. So to compute that, what I would do is I'd take the first row of V transpose, I would multiply that times all these guys, and finally I'd look at, actually let, let, me, let me modify this just a tiny bit. I'm just going to do this for the, in general, the jth row. So if I want to do this for the jth row, I take the jth row here. I would take the jth column here. And then I would take all the coefficients in this matrix. And this is how I could compute the jth row and jth column of the overall matrix. <clears throat> okay, jth, jth row, full matrix, jth column. And, and that's what I'm writing over here. And we have a name for the jth column of this V matrix. We've been calling that little vj. So that's the same guy over here, just turned on its side, little vj transpose. Okay. And the very last thing is that um, <clears throat> these guys are norm 1. Vj squared, or Vj, is norm 1. That is the property of this. So orthogonal uh, Vs, all the rows and columns are orthogonal to each other, and their unit norm. So those guys are unit norm. This Pb is a matrix with eigenvalues that are either 0 or 1. And that means that if I surround this PB by these unit norm Vs, there's no way I can get something, there's no way my quadratic form can grow larger than one, essentially by Cauchy-Schwartz, or it can never go less than zero, which is what we proved over here. So we know that these alpha Js live somewhere in the interval between zero and one, and they might, that includes 0 and 1. And um, <clears throat> so that is going to be an important ingredient as well. So this is alpha j somewhere between 0 and 1. And one last thing before we finish this part is that if we look at the sum of the alpha j's as a whole, this is going to be the trace of this matrix, right? Because the sum of these is the sum of all the diagonal elements, which as we know is the trace. Now, because it's a trace, we can bring the V to the front, then we get this. But if you remember, because this is an orthogonal matrix, this equals identity. So that vanishes and we just have the trace of PB. And so now we can expand PB like this. Again, use the trace property, bring that to the front. And we have B transpose B times its inverse. That gives us, again, identity. And in particular, it's an identity matrix that's an R by R identity matrix. So we're going to write that as identity, or I sub R, just to remind us of the dimension.
So now we're finally taking the sum of the diagonal elements of an R by R identity matrix. That's just going to be the number R. <clears throat> so finally, we can rewrite this optimization problem as follows. Here's our utility. We want to maximize this. Okay, so we want to, so we want to maximize this, but we have a couple constraints. We know that the alpha j's, their sum equals R, and we also know that the alpha j's live between 0 and 1. Okay, so we have a constrained optimization problem. Um, we could solve this with Lagrange multipliers. We could go through that whole thing. But there's actually a much more intuitive solution to this problem. Let me just say it very quickly and we'll be done. So here's a problem we we'll want to have. You can think about this as a resource allocation type problem. Let's say you go to the store and you have to make some purchases. So there's a total of D different items that you could purchase. Alpha J, let me, or let's see. Um, yeah, okay. So there's a total of D different items you can purchase. Lambda J is the reward you get for buying the Jth item. <clears throat> Alpha J is how much of that item you are going to buy. You have to buy between 0 and 1 units of every item. And you have to buy R items in total. So again, you go to the store, you have to buy R units total between 0 and 1 of every item. And you know which items you like. They're ranked. So essentially, what do you do? What purchase is most rewarding? It's very intuitive. You buy one unit each of your R favorite items. Okay, that way you're satisfying this constraint. Since you're, you're buying R in total, you're satisfying this constraint. And you're making sure that the alphas are aligned with the items you like best. <clears throat> so one unit each of the R best items means Alpha J is 1 if J is between 1 and R, or Alpha J is 0 if J is greater than R. Okay, And we know that this is kind of the right ordering because we ordered the, these lambdas from large to small. So the very first one, lambda 1, is, is our favorite one, is the, the biggest one. Okay, so finally, uh, now we know our alphas. And that essentially means that we can, um, let's see. So, so the, way that I, the way that I create the alphas that I want is I'm going to set um, B like this so that you can see that, um, I don't know how easy this is to see. Let's see. So, um, for example, if I take V1 and I plug it in here, um, because of the structure of, of PB, essentially, so PB is, let's see, it's B transpose B inverse B transpose, but, um, yeah, and so, and what I'm doing is I'm creating B using this. Essentially, if you plug, if you plug that in, that form of B into here, then because that's, these are all, all orthogonal to each other in unit norm, this guy is identity. This is just in total BB transpose, which is um, essentially VR, VR transpose. And now if you plug that into here, you can see that VJ times this will extract, th this will be a unit vec uh, vector with all zeros and, and a one. And then the V transpose J times this will be that same vector and you'll get a one or a zero. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, this is the solution we get.
We want that B hat matrix to be VR. And once we know it, we said we can compute the, um, the Z's this way. And, and this is finally how we get the X hat I. So sorry I went a few minutes over today. We can review all this stuff uh, next time so that I'll have a little more time to ask questions and make sure it makes sense. But that's the derivation of PCA. And then what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to take a look at see how well it works to compress those faces. And it's, it's pretty cool what the results look like. All right. So uh, see you guys on Wednesday.